Diplomacy is quite the limited thing in Crusader Kings 3. It is not a big topic, so I expect this guide won't go on very long, but basically, in this game, there is only one deliberate action of diplomacy outside of war, and maybe one more subtle aspect of it. So, the most obvious thing you can do in diplomacy is declare a war. Okay, this is pretty simple. I go over it a lot in my war guide, but you spend a resource to declare a war. The resource depends on what sort of war goal you are using, and you have to acquire these war goals before even going in. As an example, you can fabricate a claim on a county by getting the name of whatever job is different for so many different nations. The learning council position goes so you can fabricate a claim by sending him off to a county and depending on your luck, you might even get a claim on a duchy, not a county. You can also have certain religious based war goals if you attack a different religion. You could even push someone else's claim and to be able to push someone else's claim, they just need to be in your court or otherwise in your nation. There is even a decision to invite claimants where you spend prestige to get individuals that have claims on things to show up so that you might be able to push their claims for them, thus making them your vassal and sort of taking ownership of the location. This game does not have a typical foreign vassal system. If you have a vassal, it joins your nation. So that's more about management. There isn't exactly diplomacy with your vassals. You just kind of own them. And it goes into the character mechanics of Crusader Kings for how you make them like you. But that's kind of a whole nother topic. There are marriages you can arrange as part of diplomacy, but this is only a smaller part of a bigger thing and separate to the breeding of characters, which is not diplomacy, or well, it could be if you're using it to get claims, for example, there is kind of the main meat of your peaceful diplomacy, and that's going to be negotiating an alliance. You cannot simply negotiate an alliance with anybody that you want in this game, nor are there many logical reasons that allow or disallow alliances in this game. It's mostly set up in a way to encourage you to engage with the main bread and butter of Crusader Kings, which is really the characters and the marriages. As you see here, if I go to negotiate an alliance, the game spells out for me what allows me to get alliances. And as you can see, they are, for the most part, not entirely, based off of, am I related to the person? Am I married to the person? Or is one of my very close family members, like my children, married to one of that person's very close family members, like his children? As an example, there are some exceptions to this, such as swearing eternal support when becoming childhood friends. Considering the game extremely discourages and makes it very difficult to play as your own children, you will almost never see this. There's also one where, yeah, you swore eternal support, just kind of the other way around. But it's defensive negotiations, which is a perk that you can get. But you can only use this once on one alliance, just ever. So if I get it with Lotharingia, for example, a defensive negotiation perk one, then that's it. Unless that one expires, I cannot use it again. Unless I die and become a new character and get the perk again, because that other one wouldn't exist anymore. So generally, unless you are willing to go into your lifestyle diplomacy tree and get defensive negotiations, every single alliance that you make is going to be based on the game's marriage and family system. And even if you have defensive negotiations, when you go to make an alliance with someone, it doesn't prompt you to use that. It will just show kind of this exact thing, but it'll check in that you have the defensive negotiations perk. And it seems to take this as a list from top to bottom and goes in that order. So if you have defensive negotiations perk, it will always use this first, which is what I've experienced. So regardless of if you're actually related to somebody, every time I've made an alliance with somebody, when I had the defensive negotiations perk available, it has just immediately consumed that instead of taking something else 
later down on the list here that would qualify. So only get that perk when you are ready to use it. You have somebody in mind and when you do get it, you get a lot of pop-ups telling you you can make an alliance because it's treating it the same way as if you have just gotten one of these familial relations. Now, when you actually have an ally, that does not immediately mean you and he will be drawn into each other's wars. For example, there are conditions. Condition number one, the most important thing is, did the person request you join? Now, an AI is going to be pretty good about this, but it doesn't immediately trigger a you have to join, right? So if your ally attacks someone and wants you to join, they actually have to spend resources just to call you in, for example. Whereas if you're attacked, for example, then the resource cost isn't really a thing you have to worry about too much. There's also an aspect of familial relation. So, for example, if somebody in my house is an ally of mine let's say well as the carlings that's pretty easy to find then i can usually call these guys in for free there's a lot of conditions and little check boxes that must be met for a lot of these different things kind of like you saw with the alliances so imagine this, but there's one of these also that's asking like, well, is it an offensive war? Is it a defensive war? Is the person your house member? Is that house member in your nation? Is it the leader of another nation? Is it in another nation? And that's how it kind of figures all this out. If someone declines a call to war, that someone has spent their prestige to get you to join, for example, then there are consequences to declining that, including an immediate breaking of that alliance. So when playing in multiplayer, you can control this stuff by just, you know, requesting or not requesting, unfortunately, you know, because it's sort of a way to spend money to basically coerce someone, to force someone into joining a war. Like join or you're getting debuffed. So with players, you can at least control not debuffing each other, but you will always have to spend that money. There is no both parties agree and thus nothing is spent sort of situation. You will generally always be paying prestige unless you're relying exclusively, for example, on house members. And so that's really the meat of diplomacy in this game is negotiating the alliances, declaring war and bringing them to war. But there is one other usage of it and that is to essentially conquer something without conquering it. It doesn't appear under diplomacy, it's under vassalage and court, but in terms of what diplomacy is, this is pretty much it. If you have someone like you enough and be willing enough, that person will just join your nation for free. And this can be buffed up in the diplomacy tree, for example. Under August, there's true ruler, offer vassalization acceptance up, and then if you have better diplomacy perks, like the education, so if you get to level five, you get another buff like that as well. You could go around making an extremely large empire just by offering vassalage. So you are diplomatically offering that nation, that ruler to just surrender to you and become your vassal immediately. And that's the other real big usage of diplomacy in this game, as I would try to explain it in any other game, for example. Not everybody can be asked to become your vassal. For example, if someone's equal in rank to you, you cannot offer that person to join you as a vassal. And most, without going out of your way to make it happen, are simply not going to accept offers of vassalage anyway. So for a brief beginner's guide, that right there is basically everything. You can declare war, you can form extremely limited alliances. And as you see, you can't even form an alliance with everybody. Hastine here doesn't have that as an option or you can offer vassalage. There's a lot of little check boxes and it is extremely limiting because at the end of the day, Crusader Kings 3 is primarily a game about managing your family, your house, your dynasty, expanding it and breeding your next lineages. And so they just kind of work the diplomacy system into that. Not a very big topic as far as this game goes, but I figured at least someone would be looking up how diplomacy works in this game so well now you know 
I have a playlist of these guides in the description below. If you have any other ideas for guides, feel free to leave that in the comments below. If you have any specific questions, those can go in the comments below as well. I'll do my best to answer them. For now though, thank you guys very much for watching and I'll see you on the next one.